Some questions in an interview is more important than others. And if you mess up those questions, you are sure to be rejected. Why? Unless you understand these concepts, you cannot really design, deliver and deploy complex projects for the company. In today's video, I'm going to go over such questions and the bad and average answers that I hear that you think are good answers. And I'm also going to go over real world answers. Let's get started. First question, what is high availability? Sounds like a simple question, right? But so many candidates mess this up. The bad answers I hear is, even if a component fails, the application should still be up and that's what is meant by high availability. Or the application should fall back to another region in case of a disaster and that's what is high availability. And in case of a failure, the application should be able to serve the traffic at the same rate. Why are these bad? These are not specific, these are general broad answer. Interviewer is looking to see if you know the difference between different failover mechanisms because it comes up in real projects all the time. Like almost all the projects that I have worked in production, this high availability comes up in all of them. Now, let's take a look at a good answer for what is high availability. The high availability, this term itself is giving you the hint. Look at this availability. High availability is tied to availability zones. So high availability means even in the unlikely event of one availability zone failure, your application should still be up and running. So this is a good answer, but remember, we don't aim for good, we aim for delight. You must separate yourself from the pack, that's how you get the job. And to make this good answer delightful, you may say something to the interviewer like, hey Mr. Interviewer, let me explain with an example. I have worked on a three-tier architecture where we have external facing load balancer, then EC2s, then internal load balancer, more EC2s and Amazon DynamoDB. High availability means even in the unlikely event of failure of one availability zone, this application should still be up and running. So if we go from layer by layer, the application load balancer is inherently highly available. However, EC2s are not. One EC2 can only run in one availability zone. So to make it highly available, I will spin up another EC2 in another availability zone. And Amazon DynamoDB is inherently highly available. So even if one availability zone goes down, the DynamoDB will still be up and running. And this is what is high availability and how you can achieve this in your application. Next question that comes up a lot is, can you tell me a microservice design on AWS? So a bad answer is, I will use application load balancer with EC2, application load balancer with EKS or API gateway with Lambda. And some folks even add that I will create auto scaling groups so that load balancer is distributing the, distributing the traffic. I will have a Amazon Route 53 to assign a custom URL to the load balancer. So apparently you think, okay, this is a good answer. Not really. Why? Because it does not show any properties of microservice. What are the big properties of microservice? independent functionality, each microservice should be serving independent functionality and they could be independently developed, scaled, deployed, etc. So this answer does not really demonstrate any of those properties of microservice. This answer is okay if interviewer asks you about two-tier architecture, like, hey, Mr. Candidate, can you tell me what is a two-tier architecture? And you could say, sure. The first tier could be a load balancer interfacing all the traffic and all the business logic could be running in Amazon EC2, scaling up by auto scaling group with load balancer distributing the traffic and the database layer could be Amazon DynamoDB storing all the data. But it is not good for microservice answer. What does a delightful answer for microservice look like? Thank you for the question, Mr. Interviewer. Unlike monolithic architecture, where the entire application is built as a single tightly integrated unit, microservices is an approach where the application is built as a collection of small independent services. Because of its independent nature, each microservice can be scaled independently. 
or deployed separately. The faults are isolated and can even be developed in different tech stack. Let me give you an example with application load balancer. Let's say I have an Amazon Route 53 custom domain such as www.store.com which is routing the traffic to this application load balancer. Now let's say the user types in store.com slash browse. In that case, with path-based routing of application load balancer, the traffic will be diverted to the first microservice backend, which could be collection of EC2 instances in an auto-scaling group. And the data can be stored in Amazon DynamoDB. Similarly, for store.com slash purchase, I can send this to another target group running another set of EC2 instances. And in this case, the data is stored in Amazon Aurora. And similarly, each microservice can have different target group with different collection of compute instances. This is independent of each other because the backend of store.com slash browse is isolated from store.com slash purchase. And instead of all the backends running on Amazon EC2, it is possible that you can deploy store.com slash purchase with Kubernetes, store.com slash return with AWS Lambda. And not only that, one backend could be coded with Python, another with Node.js, another with Go, etc. This independent feature of using different programming languages is also known as polyglot feature of microservices. See how this answer is just different than general definition of microservices or just saying microservice is basically load balancer, auto scaling group and EC2. If you want the latest cloud interview guide, including GenAI interview questions and their answers, with average answers that most candidates give and delightful answers that sets you apart and get you hired, go to cloudwithraj.com slash newsletter. Again, cloudwithraj.com slash newsletter. Moving on. One of the more popular questions these days is, what are some Gen AI use cases? The average answer people say is chatbots, ChatGPT, Gen AI coding, why are this average? These are outdated answers, right? Like everyone knows chatbots, ChatGPT, GenAI coding. Uh, they are very, very generic because if you are giving this answer, other interviewers are also giving this answer. Remember, the goal is not to give the correct answer or just the good answer. We want to give delightful answers. To make the answer delightful, you have to associate the use cases with some enterprises or the domain you are working in. And these are quite outdated, right? I mean, yeah, sure, there are some new stuff happening. There is no latest enhancements in your answer. A delightful answer will be like this. There are various different Gen AI use cases in different segments, such as enhancing customer experience, improving productivity, or simply some new cutting edge use cases. Let me explain real quick. You can enhance customer experience using chatbots and virtual assistants or even agentic assistants. You can improve productivity using Gen AI use cases like content creation, report generation, search, summarization and analysis, and of course, coding. And some of the cutting edge Gen AI use cases are SRE activities using MCP, diving deep on some topic or application with MCP, debugging your application, as well as cost analysis. And a fun fact, Mr. Interviewer, I actually coded and deployed a serverless application using model context protocol very recently. Not only MCP helped me code the application, it also evaluated the application against the best practices and told me how I can improve further on that. Now, talking about MCP, this also started coming up in the interviews, which is, what is MCP? The standard answer is, MCP stands for Model Context Protocol. It standardizes the way models can use tools. Why is this average? The basics are correct, but it does not show the knowledge as a solutions architect, right? Like, when you want to become a solutions architect, you need to demonstrate that you can understand the big picture and you can dive deep on the areas as appropriate. So a great answer could be like MCP stands for Model Context Protocol. Let me explain with a quick use case. Let's say you ask the agentic app 
what's the weather in Tokyo? And the large language model has no knowledge of weather. And in that case, you have to connect to a tool which provides you the weather. But pre-MCP days, you needed to code all the logic to use this tool. So it's on you to define the API URL, the headers, the payload, etc. So for each tool your agent is using, you need to know the URL and input-output fields. MCP solves this challenge. With MCP, all you need to do is standard code to connect to any MCP server. And you do that using an MCP client. The MCP server handles the API connection to the tool. The communication between the MCP client and the MCP server follows this MCP protocol. Everything is done with JSON RPC. With this approach, even if you have to connect to multiple tools or even data sources, the code is standard to connect to just the MCP servers from the MCP client and you do not need to worry about connecting directly to the tool. So in summary, MCP is the standardized protocol for connecting to multiple tools. Tool provider gives you the MCP server and takes care of interacting with the tool. MCP does dynamic discovery of the payload schema as well as the purpose of the tool and it feeds everything to the underlying large language model so that large language model can intelligently choose which MCP server and tool to invoke. And recently, we also have MCP Marketplace to select and connect to different tools. Some of the example MCP hosts that I have worked with these days are Cloud Code or Klein with VS Code, QCLI, etc. Now, another popular topic these days is what is the difference between A2A, MCP and RAG. I do have a well-received video on this. I'll give the link up top. Give it a watch if interested. Next question. What is EDA? A bad answer is EDA stands for Event Driven Architecture. Sample EDA is API Gateway, Lambda, DynamoDB. Why is this bad? API Gateway, Lambda and DynamoDB creates a synchronous architecture and not EDA. Now this is the confusing part. Even though Lambda is always triggered by events, for example, from API Gateway, EDA has to be asynchronous. So in your answer, the definition is not enough. You need to show the properties or superpowers of EDA and ideally with an example. So let me explain the concept and then we'll go to the answer part. So a synchronous architecture will look like this. API Gateway interacting with the backend Lambda that Lambda is interacting with Amazon DynamoDB. Now let's say the traffic increases. Because this is synchronous, all these three components need to scale up at the same rate. So API Gateway is highly, highly scalable. It can handle up to 10,000 concurrent requests per second. But this Lambda might not be able to handle that throughput. So at certain point, when API Gateway keeps on scaling, API Gateway is fine, but Lambda may reach the concurrency limit and this call may have failed. So some of the challenges of synchronous architectures are all components of synchronous architecture must scale together and consumer needs to resend transactions for reprocessing in case the transaction fails. And because you are scaling everything up at the same time, you have to pay for the high scale. That's why it is expensive. And that is why event-driven or asynchronous architecture was born. In event-driven architecture, the producer and consumer are decoupled and can scale independently. So if we take the previous architecture of API Gateway, Lambda, DynamoDB, we need to put a event router or event store in between the API Gateway and Lambda. So one such solution will be API Gateway, putting the messages in a Amazon Simple Queue service or SQS, and the backend Lambda can consume these messages at a rate it is comfortable with. So advantages of EDA is each component can scale independently. Also, in case a message is delivered to this Lambda and it fails to process, it is automatically rolled back to the SQS and it will retry again. So retries are built in. Also, it is more cost-effective than synchronous architecture. In real-world architectures, 
Synchronous and event-driven architectures are stronger together. For example, in an ordering system, order inserts can be done via event-driven architecture and order status can be retrieved synchronously. Next question, what is RTO and what is RPO? An average answer is, RTO stands for recovery time objective and RPO stands for recovery point objective. RTO signifies how much time application can be down in case of a disaster and RPO measures how much data you can lose in case of a disaster. Why is this average? This is very vague and high level answer. Now, most people mess up the unit of measurement of RPO because RPO even though it measures how much data you can lose and that's why a lot of candidates say yeah you can measure RPO by unit of data like megabyte, gigabyte, petabytes etc. That is not true and in your answer even before the interviewer asks you you have to show that you know this. So always think the question behind the question right the interviewer wants to know if you actually know what is RPO measured in and how can you reduce or increase the RPO? Because you are not just interviewing for any position. You are the solutions architect. What is a good answer for RTO and RPO? RTO stands for recovery time objective and RPO stands for recovery point objective. RTO signifies the maximum acceptable time it should take to restore the application after a disaster or disruption and RPO measures maximum acceptable amount of data loss after the failure. Both RTO and RPO are measured in time. Based on RTO and RPO, we can select one of the four AWS disaster recovery strategies. So this part is what make a good answer delightful because you are not only saying the RTO RPO, you are also saying what is RTO and RPO used for. So RTO RPO is used to select one of these four disaster strategies Backup Restore, Pilot Light, Warm Standby, Multi-Site, Active Active. And to go back to my initial comment, how can you reduce RPO? Well, this should give you a hint. To reduce the RPO, you just need to take more frequent backup. And for Multi-Site, Active Active, RPO is real time because you are literally replicating the data from one region to another region. So keep in mind, disaster recovery is in between region and high availability is between different availability zones in the same region. And you should have one option ready in detail with example because this might come as a follow up. One of the popular disaster recovery strategy in critical enterprise use case is multi-site active active. So you can study this link. Another question that comes up a lot in solutions architect interview is how do you pick one service versus another as a solutions architect? Now, the things to keep in mind is there is no best or no worst service. Ask interviewer about the system requirements and based on these requirements, you have to select service A versus service B. Now, there is no short answer for this. You just have to study for this one because this is literally the bread and butter of solutions architects. But the good news is I already have a bunch of videos with playlist comparing all the comparable services. I'll give the link in the description, have a look. Remember, you need to delight the interviewer and not just meet. If you want me to cover any other questions or you have a follow-up questions on any of the topics I just covered, put them in comments. That's it for this one. I'll see you guys and girls in the next one. Bye.